so I want to talk to you about something called the GIST framework. Um, and before that, let me tell you a little bit about myself, the mandatory self-boasting. <laughs> so I have uh, three parts to my career, basically, that spans a, a bit over 20 years, actually, in the industry. I started out as an engineer, and then gradually moved to the dark side. I became a product manager in early 2000s. I worked at Microsoft and eventually I worked for about uh, six years at Google, actually in Zurich. So all those people there in Zurich, uh, Grutzi and Vigatz. <laughs> yeah, I probably murdered these expressions, apologies. And since 2017, for about uh, three years now, I'm, um, I've been a product coach, uh, helping teams and leadership teams with uh, manage product management strategy and other things. Uh, having worked in all these companies over all of these times, I became a little bit obsessed with this concept of impact and whether or not my work over all these years actually created any lasting impact. Just to show you what I mean, this is something I just found out uh, this week, honestly. There's a guy who collects all the products that Google killed over the, the years. So it starts out like AngularJS, et cetera. Google Hangouts uh, is about to die, by the way. Uh, Google Trips, Inbox by Gmail, I know about it very well. Google Plus, and it goes on and on and on and on. And there's all these products that Google launched and killed. Some of those died because of natural causes. I mean, they were good products and then they were replaced by something else, but some are actually products that maybe we shouldn't have launched. So, um, I got kind of obsessed of asking myself, what is impact and how do we measure whether or not we're creating impact? So let me give you the, my definition of impact. For me, a high impact product is one where it enables us to deliver a lot of value, hopefully to a large market. And in turn, it also helps us capture value back. And ideally these two things go hand in hand. So we create some sort of virtuous loop where we uh, both uh, deliver lots of value and capture lots of value back. And with that definition in mind, the next question is, what do product managers do in this picture? So I think our job is actually to discover that product and to help deliver it, um, the, the product that actually will make our org successful, the product that will deliver value. It's one of the most important jobs uh, in my mind in the organization but it's a very hard job. And I think most of us are not as successful as we wanted to, to be. And all of you are, I assume, product managers or product people, all of you worked on different projects. How many of the projects you, we worked on actually created a difference in uh, the lives of our customers? How many actually create some sort of step function in the business? In my experience of 20 something years, there's only two that I can point out that were really notable, that I really am super proud of, that really created, uh, it's, it's something that I will look back in with pride. So maybe I'm not the right guy to tell you about these things uh, and to coach others, but I think it's kind of the industry norm. And I think the distribution of impact looks something like that. There's projects that deliver mild impact, they're incremental improvements, absolutely fine. There's major successes, as I said, they're very rare. On the other side, there's negative things. So we launch them, we don't usually know immediately that they're negative, but bad things start to happen and eventually we roll them back. Depending how fast we are, sometimes we let them linger in our products for a long time. And then there are disasters. Luckily, disasters are also very uncommon. The disaster for me is the Galaxy Note 7 that uh, started exploding and catching fire in airplanes. So, so that's a disaster. Vista was another one. By the way, I was in Microsoft while Vista was being developed. But the vast majority of what we develop, our projects, I think, fall into this huge bucket of no impact. Now, this is not scientific. This is my own observation, but I've seen other industry veterans show similar graphs. And um, the no impact bucket is something that we work on, but doesn't change anything. The, the user just generally disregard it and nothing changes in the business. And it should be very obvious to us that no impact is a failure as well, because we could have invested our time and effort in, into something better and we haven't. I argue that it has a lot to do with planning and execution, a lot of this failure 
And basically every company I work for or every company I, I, I help today is doing some version of this, the, what I call the planning waterfall. We try to map out the long term with a plan we call strategy, product strategy, if you like. Then the, the intermediate term with a roadmap. Um, and then there's project plans that are um, typically multiple months. And then we move into execution with agile development that has more planning inside, like micro plan. And it's true that agile development killed project waterfall or improved on it. We don't do long specifications and long design and then long coding and QA and then we launch. Now we do it very iteratively. Uh, but still the projects are a bit longish and generally speaking, there's nothing agile about this picture. So if the strategy changes, all of a sudden there's this huge ripple effect and we need to go and replan our, our roadmaps and the projects and everything. The, the waterfall structure is kind of resistant to change. So as we learn new information along the process, we don't want to change it. It took so hard to develop all of these plans. We're trying to stick to them. So we're not really agile in, in the true sense of the word. There's another effect for, uh, of this uh, kind of weird merger of two, two types of planning from different eras. The people at, at, uh, sorry, at, that work at management, sales, finance, they still very much live in waterfall world. And in waterfall world, it's a wonderful world. It's really nice. Uh, you can plan technology products into the future, multiple years in advance. They will ship on time and the effect will be exactly what we expect. And honestly, as product people, we know none of this is true. There's so much uncertainty, there's so much variation. It's really hard to do planning and it's really, most of this planning is futile. Then there's another type of illusion, which is the one that lives in agile world. The people that live in agile world, the developers, uh, inadvertently given the message, all will be well as long as we keep pushing code into production. Just keep pushing small increments of working code in, in, in strict iterations, burn those uh, story points, and it will be fine. Someone will give you the business requirements. You, your job is to code, basically. Obviously, this is not what Agile is about, but that's kind of the interpretation that I see with a lot of engineers and designers. So these two groups of people are living in their own worlds that are completely an illusion, but there's a solution. And the solution is to put a person in the middle. We call this person a product manager. Well, sometimes if you ask from the other side, it's a product owner. And that person's job is to kind of make everything work. So the person is supposed to make the roadmap happen as planned. And on the other side, the product owner is supposed to feed the agile machine with stories, with, uh, with epics, with whatever it is to just make the development work. All, almost all the product managers that I meet that are stuck in this, between these two worlds are not very happy because it's a, it's a tough job. It really requires a lot of effort, a lot of meetings, a lot of stand-ups, a lot of planifications. And actually we don't have a lot of time to do product discovery. We don't have time to talk to our customers. We don't have time to do research. Experimentation is lagging. We're mostly busy delivering on the plans. So that's why I think it's time to, to move to a different type of system, which I call GIST, goals, ideas, steps, and tasks. And as I explain it to you, I assume you will hear a lot of things that are very, that are not completely new to you. And that's not surprised because almost none of it is my invention. I just took things from different disciplines, from uh, Lean Startup, from design thinking, from growth hacking, from behavioral economics, and I've kind of created my own framework, which is in my mind a bit like a product. It's something that I designed for product managers, so you guys will not have to repeat all the terrible mistakes I've done over the years. So fundamentally, it's a very simple concept. It's, I assume that we need to, uh, or I would argue, we need to uh, plan on four levels. One is goals. And goals simply state what, we try, what we're trying to achieve. Then there's ideas. Ideas are hypothetical ways to achieve the goals. Next, there are steps. Steps are mini projects that uh, develop the idea and test it at the same time. And finally, there are tasks. 
And tasks are basically the things we're managing today in Kanban boards or in Jira or in sprint backlogs. And honestly, I don't have a lot to add to, uh, to tasks. Um, I think it's pretty well managed today. We will focus on the top three layers, but we will see how this affects the way we manage the task and how Agile might work a little differently. Let's start with goals. I really like this statement by General Pett and it kind of explains what a good goal is about. If you tell people where to go, but not how to get there, you'll be amazed at the results. This is basically con capturing the concept of outcome goals. In war, if you come to war with a very well prepared battle plan and you just send the troops out to battle and say, do this and then do that and do the other, you're basically setting them up to fail because the world is so random and so un unpredictable that battle plans basically crumble immediately. A better way to, do, to go about it is to give them missions. You need to conquer this bridge, you need to cross this line, you need to protect this uh, facility. While the conditions on the ground may change and the solutions that they will have to deploy, deploy will, may change, the mission will persist longer. So it's actually possible to plan longer with goals. Goals are more robust and resistant to change. Good outcome goals basically state two things. Where do we want to be and by when and how will we know that we got there? There's a third element that is very important, which is the why. What is the context that brought about this goal? And Intel in the early 1970s gave names to these things, objectives and key results. Now, obviously, many of you are using OKRs and many of you have, are spending a lot of time in developing OKRs. Unfortunately, a lot of the OKRs that I see are um, not very good. So I might see something like that. Let's become the leader in the enterprise. That's actually a perfectly valid objective. It's aspirational, it's long-term. But then the key results about launching this project that we really care about or integrating with a platform or using some technology, blockchain, machine learning, etc. And actually all of these things are actually are the equivalent of sending the troops to the battle with a battle plan. These are outputs. These are things we think we should do in order to achieve the, the outcomes. But these are not the outcomes. And we are actually, because of randomness and unpredictability, might actually not get the outcomes we expect by putting in these key results. So let's not do that. Instead, let's use metrics. Actually, in this day and age, there's no excuse not to use metrics. So two types of metrics. One is impact metrics, where we, I will talk about them in a second. And the other are outcome metrics. Outcome metrics are usually about behavior. Either, either it's user behavior, customer behavior. If you're using a develop, developing a system for internal people, uh, internal employees, their behavior. Uh, and this can be captured in file metrics, in other type of uh, submetrics. But sometimes you want to also focus on system performance or on quality metrics, like number of errors reported. But it's really important to find a way to measure impact. That's where I started from. So we said impact is about delivering value and capturing value. How do we measure this? This sounds a bit hard. So the good news is for capturing value, we have a ton of metrics. We measure revenue, we measure profit, we measure market share, uh, monthly recurring revenue, et cetera. The trick here is actually to pick one and to focus the entire company on it and say, this is the top KPI. This is the guy we care about the most. If we're trying, if we're sending the company to try to optimize for multiple captured value uh, metrics at the same time, usually, none of them will be optimized fully. So it's important for management to say this year is the year of revenue and that's what we want to accomplish. But even more important is how do we measure delivered value? And for that, we have a, a metric that is called the North Star metric. And it's a very important framework that if you're not using it just now, I highly recommend starting. The North Star metric essentially tries to measure the total amount of value that we're delivering to the market to approximate it. Let's see a few examples from very famous companies. So Facebook from very early on measured daily active users. And daily active users sounds like a value captured metric, which it is. 
it's a it's a market share sort of uh, metric. But in a social network, the more active users you you have, the more likely the, the social network to function. When you come, you find the people you care about. You find their posts, their personal information, their images. You can connect with them. They will start liking and uh, and commenting on your posts. We get those this social acceptance stuff that we care for in social networks. So daily active users actually approximates the total value of the, of the social network. WhatsApp is measuring messages sent. For a WhatsApp user, every message sent is a little increment of value because it's free, it's rich, you can send it uh, at any, from anywhere in the world. Compare the two, this to SMS when WhatsApp got started. So assume that in WhatsApp there is a chart and in that chart they, they count the number of messages. If that, the number of messages from one year to the next doubled, we can approximately say that we delivered double the value to the market. For that reason, while I was working in, uh, at YouTube, we started counting minutes watched uh, instead of uh, views. Lastly, Airbnb and eBay are two-sided marketplaces. And they measure value by the amount of value exchange. So for Airbnb, it's nights booked. For eBay, it's gross merchandise volume, which is the total number of dollars or euros being exchanged. Notice that they're not counting how much of this money ends up in their pockets. It's all about how well the marketplace is performing. Once we have these uh, two impact metrics mapped out, we can actually start creating a little bit of roadmap around them. So obviously for the top KPI, which in this case, in this company, it's revenue, we probably have a plan how we expect revenue to grow quarter over quarter. But we can do the same for the North Star metric. So in this company, the North Star metric is number of documents created. Imagine the CEO coming to the all hands meeting and instead of just repeating the same old mission statement, she says, you know, this year we expect to grow the number of documents created by 150%. This year we need to grow revenue by that much. If you're not working on anything that actually is going to contribute to these two things, you should talk to your manager because maybe you're not working on the right thing. That alone sends a much stronger sense of mission to the, to the people. That is much more concrete. This is something they can get behind. Especially for product teams, the North Star metric is kind of their guiding light because sending engineers and, develop, and, and designers and other product people to chase revenue is sometimes not very clear and not very concrete. Another thing we can do with these two top metrics is start breaking them into their submetrics and create trees, or sometimes these are not trees, or these are graphs. And then we can allocate, choose teams or virtual teams to own certain submetrics that are important. And then we have a little bit of a growth model, if you like, and we can see where we're performing well or, or not as good. And we can create, put metrics into our OKRs from here. Once we have all of this in place, we can do multi-level OKRs. And for uh, a company under, so let's say 500 people, I suggest doing just two levels, company level and team level, but you can do even at product level, business unit level, whatever level you prefer. And OKRs are very important as a tool to scale and align uh, um, goals and to also uh, ensure cross alignment between teams. So it's not just up, down, but also side to side. There's a lot to OKRs. The sad news is that OKRs alone will not protect you from bad goals, from output goals. You need to also watch out for the quality of the goals you put into them. Let's move on then to the next level, which is ideas. So we all have many product ideas uh, and they could be about new features, design, etc. But the sad news is that most of these ideas are not going to work. We know this because because of research done in many different companies. Ron Kohavi is a famous uh, data analyst and experimentation expert and a manager, VP, uh, that worked for Microsoft. He works now in Airbnb, he worked in the past in Amazon, and he, he worked with a lot of other companies. Stefan Thonke is a Harvard uh, uh, Business School professor. And together they wrote this article and they say this, the vast majority of ideas fail in experiments and even experts often misjudge which ones will pay off. 
and Google and Bing, only about 10 to 20% of experiments generate positive results at Microsoft. As a whole, one third prove effective, one third have neutral results, and one third have negative results. So here's another bit of information I want to tell you. Having 30% successful ideas is a fantastic ratio. Very few companies actually reach it. Usually those are companies that understand the market and their users very, very well because they invest tremendous amount of resources into research. In ordinary companies, the ones I, I encounter, the ones I worked with, uh, it's usually around 15%. And that's also the industry average, between 10 and 15%. Which means if you look right now at what's in your product backlog or in your roadmap, between 85 and 90% of what's there shouldn't be developed. It's either going to develop to deliver no value or negative value. I think we can draw inspiration to the solution from science. So scientists don't just sit and convince each other in a room with opinions, they try out many ideas. Or as Linus Pauling, one of the discoverers of the DNA said, if you want to have good ideas, you must have many. Most of them will be wrong, and what you have to learn is which ones to throw away. How can we bring this into our own products? I suggest this, as ideas come, don't say no. As product managers, we're very proficient and deflecting ideas, rejecting them upfront. I suggest not doing this. I suggest doing, saying yes, but it's a soft yes. All that it, we mean by this is we are willing to consider this idea. Then take the idea, capture the essence of the idea and put it in an idea bank, which is a repository of ideas. It could be a spreadsheet, a database, whatever you, you like. Then we will use the prioritization system. I recommend ICE, which I'll explain in a second. And ICE basically just gives us a hint into which ideas we should invest in first. It's not the exact science, it's just a hint. Then we can pick some ideas. It, this could be the ideas that are top ranking according to ICE, or they, they could be just ideas in the middle. From time to time, we can boost something in the middle, even in the bottom. We do this either because we see potential and we think maybe ICE is penalizing a really good idea, or because we cannot say no to this idea because it's the pet project of a CEO or of a, a powerful stakeholder. But that's okay, we're not going to build now an 18 months project around this idea. What we are going to do is run the ideas into steps. Steps are basically evaluation steps, tests and experiments. I will explain those in a second. And the nice thing about steps is that they generate results. And once we have this result, we can go back and update the I score. And that means that some ideas will go up in the prioritization order, but actually most of them will go down just because that's the statistic. So the idea bank is not just a repository of ideas, it's kind of a knowledge base of learning in this sense. This is what an idea bank looks like. Not surprisingly, it's a, this is just a schematic view. There's more fields usually. It's a list of, um, of ideas. And for each one, we have three key attributes, impact, confidence, and ease. Each one is in the range of zero to 10. Then we multiply the three and that's the I score, which is in the range of zero to uh, 1000. Basically impact um, suggests to us in the best case scenario, or within reason, how much impact will this uh, idea have on the core metric? By how much percentage wise, the core metric will grow. What is the core metric? Almost always it's the North Star metric of the company or the division, if you have multiple divisions and they have different North Star metrics. We want all teams to measure their ideas against North Star metric of the company. So if your company, let's say it's a, is an ad tech company, and you're measuring number of impression that, impressions that you are serving for your customers, the brand customers that uh, use your technology, an idea that delivers more impressions is higher impact than an idea that delivers fewer impressions. Is basically judges uh, how easy or how the idea is going to be. If it's going to take two weeks, I'll give it a 10, because it's very easy. If it takes me 23 weeks, I'll give it a two because it's not super easy. Why these numbers? Because that's my scale. You can create a different scale. Theoretically, impact and ease is all we need to go by. And a lot of people actually recommend doing an impact ease or impact effort 
analysis, but there is a problem. And these very, two very famous psychologists identified it. It's called the planning fallacy. When planning, people and teams tend to be overly optimistic, underestimating the time, cost, and risk, and at the same time, overestimating the benefits. I don't know if this ever happened to you, if you ever fell in love with an idea or saw someone else fall in love with an idea, but what actually they are telling us is that we're very bad at judging impact and ease. And just relying on our intuitions will send us down the wrong path. So for that reason, we have the third element, which is confidence. Confidence basically is trying to tell us how sure are we that the impact is going to be what it is. Impact is where most of the uncertainty is. How can we answer this question? Again, science gives us a, a, a clue. Scientists look for evidence. So we should look for evidence too. But not all evidence is created equal. And some evidence is strong and some evidence is weak. So in order to deal with this question, what evidence do we have and how much should we, uh, weight should we put on it, I created this tool, which I call the confidence meter. It works a little bit like a thermometer. It goes from very low confidence, the blue area, sub-zero if you like, up to, to a very high confidence, the red area. And there's different buckets of evidence that contribute more or less. So everything in the blue area, self-conviction, having a pitch deck, thematic support, like uh, relying on some buzzword or, align, or relying on the company strategy, these are actually opinions, opinions in, in, in disguise. So they give us very lo low confidence. If we review the idea with, with multiple team members, management, and they're all in support, that's great. It makes us feel good, but still it's opinions. So it's still low confidence. If we start estimating the idea, we're doing some planning, if we do risk analysis, if we build a business model, if we do a back of the envelope calculation, that actually is a harder test. And you would be surprised to know how many ideas actually die at this level. So that gives us a little bit more confidence, but still it's all on paper. We need to go out and collect uh, evidence from outside the building. So anecdotal evidence is about finding a few points of evidence. It could be in our logs, it could be in discussions with customers, it could be one customer request or a top or a sales request. These things are anecdotal. Anecdotal is great. It shows that there's some support, but it's weak still. It's still low confidence. In order to gain more confidence, we need to go to the market and collect much more data through surveys, smoke tests, competitor analysis, and more. But really to gain medium and high confidence, we need to start launching tests and collecting real evidence from users. We need to put a version of the idea in front of users and measure their behaviors. So this goes for all, the, all from interviews and, uh, and prototype studies, all the way up to A-B experiments, which are really the hardest tests to succeed in. But that alone doesn't give us full confidence. Full confidence actually comes from launching and monitoring the result. So this is a tool that I highly recommend using. It kind of changes the discussion. A lot of opinions and biases are kind of falling apart in, if you use this uh, tool correctly. And together it, it kind of complements the total I score. Let's move on to steps. So once we have an idea we like, it's tempting to say, okay, let's stop here and let's start building it and then learning what happens. But of course, this just defers the learning and we might actually st have stumbled on one of the 90% of bad ideas rather than 10% of good ideas. Instead, of course, we want to do this. Instead of launching the whole thing, we want to launch milestones. But these are not engineering milestones. These are learning milestones. So we want to learn. We want to test the core assumptions of the idea and device uh, experiments and tests that will teach us things about this idea. And you can see that the direction of the arrow is changing because we learn and we change direction as we go along. And the idea that we will launch at the end will be much more profound than the one we started with. Each one of those is a mini project, which I call a step. In most companies, steps are no longer than 10 weeks long. And they always culminate in a, a test or experiment. If you do the, the work correctly, over time, your I score will update from one round to the next. This is an example from uh, my blog. Um, 
it's kind of a synthetic example, but it compares two ideas, a dashboard and a chatbot. And for a long time, they seem kind of equal, but then when you, as we continue moving forward, gradually the I score of one climbs up while the other declines because of user evidence. Most ideas will, will die much sooner than five steps. We don't need to do five steps. A lot of times one or two is enough. Then we need to realize there's, there's a wide gamut of ways to test ideas and validate them. I like to split this into five buckets, which together stands, uh, use the, uh, create the acronym AFTER, assessment, fact-finding, test, experiments, and release. So assessment is everything we can do quickly or rather quickly without actually looking for data. We can look whether or not it aligns with the goals, we can do business modeling, we can do the ice analysis, we talked about assumption mapping. There's a bunch of things we can do here. Fact finding is about going out and looking for data through surveys, through user interviews, through data analysis, etc. But we're not testing the idea just yet. We're mostly just collecting information and, it, and looking for supporting facts. Then there are tests, and we have early tests, which are about testing the concept without actually building much. And later we have middle stage tests, and finally advanced tests where the idea is almost fully developed, and we're testing it to find out the, the, the last flaws. For me, experiments, which are mostly A-B experiments, I'm using the statistical term for experiments, it's a test that has also a control element. So those are very important and I highly recommend using them if you have enough data. Even the release itself is a type of, uh, of test. So we can do percent launches, we can do holdback experiments, and we can monitor post launch. So we should use the release phase as well as a way to validate our ideas. Let's put the whole thing together. So again, we have four layers. Each one has different tools and different scopes, goals, at the company level, we usually can plan yearly, and then at the team level, we, we plan quarterly. But we test them, we, we check, and do sync points on the goals multiple times per quarter. Ideas are being collected constantly. There's not just one time where we want to collect ideas and stop. They just keep coming, and as, as they come, we take them, and we keep testing ideas. Steps, we, we kind of create the initial step plan, and I will show you how it looks. Uh, at the beginning of the quarter, but we keep updating it. It's completely agile and we change the, the sort of steps we want, and the sort of ideas we're actually trying to test as we move along based on learned information. And tasks, of course, you can use the current rhythm of one or two weeks uh, for your sp sprints or your uh, Kanban cycles. A lot of teams like this tool, the GIST board. It can be a physical board or a digital board, but essentially it kind of captures the top three layers of GIST. So we have goals and here, here it's key results. So for example, if you want to shorter the average onboarding time to less than two days, here's the key result and below it is where we are today. Here's a couple of ideas that are trying to implement this, this goal. Uh, these key results with their I scores. And here's a few steps that we see that can kind of lead us forward. There's no point in trying to map out all the steps. These are the immediate few steps with the owners, the people that are most responsible to drive them. And usually we have a little bit of a cross-functional team behind each, each step. Notice that we can put in here as well, uh, engineering and design goals. So for example, reducing technical debt, refactoring the matcher, whatever it is, we need to make sure that this board is not just about business ideas. The outcome of all, everything I explained to you, and this is actually not just in theory, this is uh, actually being used today by multiple companies. Maybe some of you even uh, in your companies are using GIST already, is that we're kind of breaking the walls. So now uh, a developer is not just kind of focused on pushing a, an increment of code and moving on to the next uh, task and the next task they realize that this task is out there to implement a step. And the step is there to develop and test an idea. And the idea is there to, to, to achieve a goal. And ideally, this is a goal that that developer had a hand in creating or defining. So it helps in connecting our development teams with the business. And you'd be surprised how much they like it. It's much more interesting for them. It's much more 
uh, they have a lot more context. And it actually requires you to hold their hand much less and, and, food and, and you don't have to spoon feed them with requirements as much as before. On the other side, for the managers, for the business people, there's much more transparency and much more clarity into what's going on. You discuss with them the goals. That's really the level where you want to do the negotiation. Then you show them which ideas uh, you're actually testing. You're, you're not committing to an ideas. You don't create a roadmap of ideas, but you are showing them your gist board and they know which ideas. And some of these ideas are theirs. But they can also see the steps. They can also see the test results and they can understand why you rejected a certain idea or you, you're investing more in another idea. And you can actually pull them in and involve them in interpretation of the ideas. That's a good way for them to stay in the loop without actually telling you what to do. And for the product manager, I think this is a better world. We are now much more in control of, all, of the job that I think we should be doing, which is discovering and delivering a product that delivers high impact, rather than just perpetuating some sort of very antiquated idea of how to develop products. Uh, all of the, everything I told you today is kind of captured in my articles, in a book that I'm writing, which uh, hopefully will come out this year. And there's also some tools that you guys can use right now. So the confidence method that I've shown you, I implemented it as a spreadsheet, as a calculator. You can just fit in the, the evidence you have today and it will spit out a number. The GIS board, you, you have an editable, edit, editable version in PowerPoint or Google Slides. I have a handbook that covers the after framework, uh, an ebook. Uh, so all of these things are available on my uh, website and the links are here. I will share the slides with you guys later, if you like. Thank you, and I think it's time for Q&A. Great, thanks a lot, Itamar, that was awesome. Uh, hey, uh, dear people, folks, give me a virtual clap if you know how that, how that works. It's the reaction button. Give me a virtual clap. Yeah, and the cheers in the chat, please. Like we can really cheer. Yeah, that looks awesome. It looks so nice. <laughs> yeah, so um, I have tried to collect all your questions in a Slido. And, uh, oh yeah, wait a sec, timer, stop. Um, and I will now go through, I will share my screen and um, we'll go through the questions on Slido now. So now I need someone to tell me if you see my screen. Yeah, okay, yes. per perfect, great, thank you. Uh, so let's start with the top one. Um, you can vote if you want, I will just go from top to bottom and then while you're going through the questions, you can vote if you want and um, we can add them uh, in here. Okay, first question. How is the confidence value of near zero, not almost a no? You're muted. Hi, this is Julian. This was my question. Do you want me to, to explain my question? Uh, yes, and if you can do it in a couple of sentences. Okay, so um, as you show that the confidence is a value which can be 0 0.1, 0 0.8, something below one. Mm -hmm. uh, it reduces kind of the other two factors dramatically, I think. And in the beginning, you said, or while introducing it, you said, don't say no to ideas. But how would managers deal with an almost or near zero value in your confidence and utilize it as saying no? or like of height saying no. So who is actually giving this value? All right, so the way it works is, let's say someone comes to you with an idea. It could be a team member, it could be your own idea, it could be a manager. And uh, they say, you know, what's the best thing we can do with our product? I just, had the, I just went golfing with my buddies. This is a manager story, an exec. And they told me we should really do blockchain. And then the question should be, all right, but what evidence do we have? If all we have to go by is the opinion of the, the friends of the manager, then it's a 0 0.01. 
is it a yes? Is it a no? We don't know. We should also kind of guesstimate the impact and we should also uh, think about ease. Then we have a number. Then we see how it stacks up against other things. Most ideas start out with very low confidence because we don't have any other evidence except our own opinions. But that's fine because as we go forward in the cycle, as we test some ideas, as we pick some ideas to, to, to put into steps, evidence will come. So, and it could be supportive evidence. So let's say you, you have a streaming uh, service and the top request from customers is 4K streaming. Say so fantastic, this is already some evidence this is a, a top uh, user request. Let's also analyze how many of these users have a 4K enabled device. And it comes out to be 8%. So you give them the confidence boost for being the top request, but that other data point does not give them any confidence boost. So the idea is once we pick up an idea, we will start collecting evidence and ask ourselves, two questions, is this evidence in support of the idea? And what is the weight that we give to this evidence based on the tool? And then ideas slowly but surely will start moving from the 0 0.01 into the higher realms. Okay, cool, right. thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's look at the next one. How do you deal with managers introducing just by just replacing terms and not changing the mindset like we experience quite often in Scrum? Interesting question. Is this someone who actually had just introduced this way or is just hypothetical? Hi, this is Julian again. <laughs> Thanks for popping that up. Um, no, it's theoretically, but I do experience that in Scrum quite often. So I can imagine as it's being a mindset thing, we could have this issue as well. Absolutely. I, I have seen this actually. I mean, processes and methodologies are like products. They can be overused, they can be abused, they can be misused. And a lot of the process, the, the good methodologies and ideas we've seen come over the past 15 years, like uh, Lean Startup are being misused a lot of times. People are saying, okay, let's build an MVP, but the MVP is actually a better project. It's, uh, it's not really minimal uh, viable product. Uh, so I worry a lot about this happening with GIST. And I've seen some examples where people are saying, okay, goals is the responsibility of managers, ideas is the responsibility of uh, senior product managers, and step is the steps is the responsibility of uh, junior product managers. Absolutely not the way I recommend it. I recommend that every product team will have its own GIST stack, its own goals, its own ideas, and, and should manage its own GIST board. How do you combat this? Education. That's why I try to put out a lot of uh, articles and uh, examples out there, and hopefully the book. Um, but also open discussion. I mean, if you think a, a manager is just abusing it, if the culture is right in your company, you should be honest about this. You should be telling the truth. We definitely do not, don't want to abuse it the way some teams abuse Scrum these days. Uh, I think that's uh, that would be too sad. Okay, thank All right. you. Thank you. Next one. How do you visualize dependencies between project ideas? How do I visualize dependencies between project ideas? Did I say that I'm trying to, to visualize it? Not necessarily. I mean, dependencies exist. I like to tackle the dependencies at the goal level already. So um, if you know you're going to, you have a goal. And in order for this goal to actually happen, you need the support or help of another team or another division sometimes another group of people, you should try using what's called a shared goal and, and ask them whether or not they would like to, um, to partake in this goal. And if they say yes, there's a chance you, the dependencies will work out. If, if they say no, then probably you shouldn't pursue this goal and, and this idea. 
on the idea level, some ideas definitely are bigger and span multiple teams. I mean, there's a lot of ideas we can do at the product team level, but sometimes there are bigger ideas. And those ideas generally are managed in a separate JS board that is more strategic, and it's usually a director level or a, a senior product manager is managing it. But as much as possible, we want people from the teams to own parts of it. And we want to enable teams, even if they're all working on this one big project, to be tactically independent and just strategically aligned. What we want to avoid is big room planning, where we all come into a room every two weeks and everyone's like outlaying all their plans and all their ideas and all their tasks and, and we map out all the dependencies. I don't think that works. It's a bit sideline to gist, but I think this is big room planning is a bit hard to, to maintain on the long term. So I suggest where you detect the dependencies at the goal level already, and then pick very few big projects where that spend multiple teams and then create ideas at this level, but involve the teams in owning parts of the idea. Cool. All right, thank you. Uh, next one, I would actually like to skip the next one and would ask the second one, how do you quantify technical drawbacks avoiding the term tech debt here on the ideas? This is new to me. What's the difference between, what is technical drawback actually? Um, <clears throat> I, I actually want, didn't want to say technical debt here, but you had it also in your slides. So for me, the, the, the thinking was around this, um, the example of, hey, we would be able to double our North Star metric in the next quarter or month for a certain time frame if we are doing a lot of shortcuts. Shortcuts would be these technical um, drawbacks that we introduce into our architecture. Um, so we would be able to do that, but in the long run, I'm talking about uh, a year or multiple years, we would have a lot of problems with, uh, we would be slower, uh, adding new features would be slower. Uh, we would have a lot of support calls. We would have a lot of maintenance effort. So would that be also something that you visualize somewhere as part of every, of every project idea or? So, First of all, it's, it's a completely true point. And I think the practice of rushing the team out to test something with, a, I don't know, a prototype, then an MVP, etc., but then not letting them have the time and the cycles to actually clean it up and bring it to the level of quality it should be, not letting them cl clean up the shortcuts is a very, very bad practice. It's self-defeating and it's demoralizing for the product, the engineering team. And in the long term, as you said very clearly and correctly, it's, uh, it hurts the business as well. I argue that um, this sort of thing does not really fit well in an idea bank, but it does need to live in the discussion that the team is holding when they're planning the quarter. Mm -hmm. or when they're planning on a weekly or bi-weekly, they change the, the step plan. And that's why I mentioned that technical depth and design depth as well, or draw, drawbacks or whatever you prefer to call them, should be part of this discussion. So the, the PM should have a counterpart, which is the engineering manager. And that engineering manager, in my mind, should manage its, his own or her own list of engineering initiatives and a design partner who's managing design initiatives. And at least the three of them need to have a clear discussion from time to time about what are the priorities between these things. And sometimes the decision should be, we stop everything for two months and just clean the code because we're in such deep mud that we must do this. And I've seen this happen in Google. Um, but it is important to have the full discussion and not to kind of do it under the covers. Some engineering teams do it under the covers because they know that their ideas will never actually win against the business ideas. So they go and secretly actually do the technical dev cleanups or the refactoring or the implementation of the new database. And then the product managers realize just later that they got maybe 60% of the time of the team. Mm -hmm. So I would argue, let's put it all out. Mm -hmm. No hidden projects mm -hmm. and good, clear discussion. Transparency. Cool. Thank you. 
All right, thanks. Next one is now, you mentioned learning. How do you share learnings in the org? So basically every time you go out into a step, every time you, um, you test an idea, and the test can be as simple as like, we ran this um, landing page, or we did a phone interview with 15 users, or we ran a dog food inside. Immediately after you have the results, you analyze them, you ask yourself, what did we learn? Sometimes it's good to do this in a team. Some companies like Netflix have a regular weekly or bi-weekly meeting where people build, bring their experiments and some veterans sit there in the meeting and help them analyze them. Once you are convinced you learned something, you need to share it immediately. I would suggest uh, having a regular newsletter about your projects to all the interesting stakeholders or uh, you can do a little video and share it, or you can do a little presentation, but immediately share with them and say, this is what we learned. And here's what we're going to do next. And uh, if, you, or if you think otherwise, if you think our interpretation is wrong, tell us. This is more important than we think. They really appreciate the learning the, and the feedback, and they are very, very interested to uh, actually pursue the things that are of high value. So a great way to kill an idea is actually to test it and then share the results with the person that uh, gave you the idea. A lot of time that senior manager will tell you, you know what, given that, I don't think we should actually pursue this idea. You let them kill it themselves. Uh, it could backfire, of course, but I think sharing the learning is, is a key thing in every organization. Mm. And it could also help to regarding the transparency because it's it's okay to make a mistake. We learn something, so that would be good from a cultural perspective as well. Cool. Uh, I'm just... I wouldn't use the, the word mistake here. I would just say we had a bad idea, the, and, mm -hmm. and that's normal. Most ideas are bad. Uh, just as an example, uh, one um, marketplace that I that is using Gist in Austria. Um, the PMs there use Gist as a, in a spreadsheet. And often they see the, um, the general manager and stakeholders opening the spreadsheet and looking at the ideas and the, and the, and the steps and what actually transpired with their, with their ideas. So it's sometimes the communication is even transparent. You don't even have to push, they are pulling the information for you. Mm, cool, thank you. All right, so I would give two more minutes to this list and then I would like to also open it up a bit so like people can actually talk. Um, so I, I see new questions coming in. Um, so maybe we can just talk about them like in the other five minutes. Let's take the next one, which is what is your experience with incentives tied to a metric, individual or team incentives? Oh, that's a really tough one. Uh, I don't think we know how to incentivize teams and organizations at large right now. Um, I think there's a lot of in incentives today around output and that actually doesn't work very well. Uh, I think incentivizing around outcomes is promising, but it's reality is that it's very hard to achieve outcomes. Sometimes reality is stronger than you. So, I have a set of metrics that I like to track in GIST, which is the number of ideas we test, the numbers of ideas that, uh, uh, the number of steps that uh, generated the uh, meaningful learning, the number of ideas that actually got released. And I think these things create trends. Like we can track them and we see, okay, we started testing more and more ideas. That's a positive. The team that is actually able to test more ideas is usually in a better position to to succeed more. Uh, we managed to gain more um, learning. So usually again, that's a strong signal for a team if they are able to, 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 uh, to gain learning consistently that they are performing well. I'm using the term team here because on a personal level, I think it's very hard to, to measure people on these things, but teams should definitely be measured. How you tied incentives? That's a question that I cannot answer right now. All right, thank you. So time is up. Let's take five minutes for like some talking. So if uh, people, I'll stop sharing my screen. 
Um, and if people want to ask questions, please raise your hands in the, it's down there in the participants view. There is a little blue hand and then raise your hands and I will pick you one by one and then you can just freely ask your question. You know, let's hear your voices a bit. So, oh, wait a sec. Could you find it? So it's in Zoom down there, it says participants. When you click that, then on the right hand side in the participants view, you should see a blue hand. If you click that, then I'll see your hand popping up in the participants list. Oh, I see there's also go faster. I'm glad uh, the, no one saw this before. Okay, uh, I'm not sure if I pronounced your name co correct, Allah. Unmute and go ahead, please. You seem to be walking Hello. somewhere. Yes. We can't hear you. Hello. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Perfect. Sorry. Um, actually, I have two questions, but definitely feel free to skip the second one. The first one is, uh, if we are to implement just today, what uh, things you would recommend or you would uh, tell us to watch out for like uh, traps or, or, or misunderstandings we might do um, you might have seen in your experience um, the second one is about the incentives uh, again um, is incentives around impact or have you seen it in your experience that if you tie incentive about impact in terms of shares in on the captured value work like did you see it ever work or not uh, that's, that's the questions all right, to answer your first question, uh, a common challenge I see with teams is trying to, to do the whole thing all at once. Like uh, the manager gets excited about GIST and then they set a goal, okay, by the end of the quarter, we want to implement GIST. And that's a ton of work because you need to do goals properly, outcome goals, most companies don't do this just yet. You need to start building idea banks at the team level and also the, those bigger ideas at the director level, potentially, you know, need to start scoring ideas, uh, and then you need to do experimentation, build measure, learn loops, uh, steps, etc. And then you need to tie this and, and sell this to your engineering team as well. They actually usually like it very much. It's a very easy sell to engineers. Um, and then it's kind of overwhelming for the team and the team kind of loses steam because it's trying to do too much. So I would argue, uh, try to first identify where the biggest pain is. So if the biggest pain is that the goals are completely unclear, like you guys, every quarter you're chasing completely different things. There's no alignment in the organization. Everyone's pulling in a different direction. Try to implement no style metric, try to build the metrics tree and try to introduce good OKRs. If the, the problem is that there's endless debates about ideas, constant discussions and uh, arguments and, and back and forth, and it's all opinion based, try to implement uh, uh, idea banks and ICE. If the problem is that you're not testing enough, you're just launching implement steps. If the problem is that your development team is very disengaged and only focused on uh, coding, try to implement the gist board at the bottom part of the of the idea bank obviously the gist board requires some goals and some ideas but you can kind of wing it but try to bring the engineers out of their bubble and into the world of goals and ideas and steps so that's my recommendation about not trying to do all of it at once it takes a couple of quarters if you're a small team sometimes longer to really perfect it but you can be up and running in in a few months, depending on how dedicated you are. It's very important to have uh, a champion at the exec level. That's really helpful. Uh, or to create some sort of safe sandbox where they allow you to experiment with GIST. Otherwise, it, if it runs into other kind of disciplines, it might be crashed by, by lack of support. To your second question about incentives, honestly, I don't have a good answer for this. I didn't do enough research, so I prefer to, to skip at this point. All right, thank, thank you. you. Uh, let's take a last question, Christian. 
Yeah, hello. Um, my question, um, it was also in slide, was about um, yeah, large platforms. So what we do, we often have um, the kind of the task to build a capability like a multi-merchant capability across a dozen products or even more. And that kind of calls for building a project and kind of doing waterfall. So do you think we can actually apply just when building capabilities across a lot of products? So one, one aspect of that is dependency. You talked about this already. There are a lot of dependencies among the teams. The other problem I see is um, that impact is hard to measure on each product because they're all contributing to a bigger goal of making the whole platform, like, for example, multi-merchant capable. So just so I understand, you are a type of infrastructure team that builds a platform, a shared platform or a shared set of components that other projects are using? Yeah. Yeah, or the whole company says, okay, the, new, the business model is now like moving from a retailer to, a, let's say, a marketplace. Mm -hmm. and we, every system has to be capable of handling multiple merchants on the platform. That could be an example. But also back-end programs. I mean, for example, I'm working on products like inventory management, very fundamental layer. Right. So uh, these are two different challenges. I mean, if there is this uh, new strategy and you're focusing on this new type of customer, that's absolutely a goal that can trickle down to the team level and each team level can set itself a goal to, to measure impact on, and, and probably this will mean also a change in the North Star or at least uh, one level below the North Star, there'll be this other new branch that is about this new type of client. So that kind of change, I think this kind of ch challenge is captured pretty well with the goal system as it is. The backend system or the infrastructure system is a different challenge. And often the challenge here is it's very hard to map the work that these teams do directly to the North Star metric of the company. So again, if, uh, if the North Star metric is say number of documents created, but we're not building anything that actually impacts the users directly, we're building capabilities that other teams might or may not use, by the way, because sometimes they're, they're preferring to build it themselves or they use uh, off-the-shelf solutions. In these cases, I prefer that the team will use a local North Star metric, which is about how well are they serving their internal customers. So switching the focus from the external customer to the internal customer and inventing a North Star metric around that. And that's actually the more, uh, and then everything falls into place and you can use the whole G system. And there's multiple examples of clients I'm working with that are doing just that. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Itamar. Um, thanks a lot, everybody, for joining.